Hi, I'm Gary Huffbauer. Can I invite everyone to uh, find a seat and uh, sit down with their cookies and drinks? Uh, the Institute's president, Adam Posen, is traveling today, so it's my pleasure to welcome you and to thank you for coming at what is a, a rather unusual time in our schedule and probably your schedule as well. Uh, the Institute, under Adam's direction, has um, <clears throat> had many more cooperative meetings with other institutions, and today we are extremely happy to have a meeting uh, which has uh, actually been uh, promoted by the World Bank, specifically by Annabel Gonzalez, who recently joined the World Bank in a very senior position. And I am going to ask her to come to the microphone and introduce our two uh, speakers today. And we have, we're deliberately going to give, uh, to, to narrow the time that they're going to speak because we want to maximize the time for questions and answers. As I look at this audience, it is an extremely informed audience with probably a lot of questions on the trade issues that Jeff and um, Patrick will be talking about. So their remarks will be fairly short, and please uh, pepper them with questions afterwards. Annabelle. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gary. And uh, on behalf of the World Bank Group Global Practice and Trade and Competitiveness, let me thank you uh, for uh, for organizing uh, this event uh, and uh, and uh, giving us the opportunity to have. Uh, uh, Patrick and uh, Jeff uh, with us here today. Uh, let me say a few words uh, about Patrick Lowe. Uh, as Vice President of Research, uh, Patrick uh, directs, oversees, and coordinates uh, the Fung's Global Institute Research Projects uh, based in Hong Kong. Uh, as a senior fellow, uh, he also undertakes and leads research into global supply chains, international trade, and global governance. Uh, Patrick, as I think uh, uh, most of us know, uh, was the chief economist at the WTO since its creation in 1995, having previously worked at the GATT Secretariat from 1980 to 1987. Uh, after joining the WTO, he worked on trading services for two years before his appointment at, as a chief economist in 1997. And from 1999 to 2000, he served as WTO Director General Mike Moore's chief of staff after which he returned to his previous post as uh, chief economist. Among his many um, uh, activities, Patrick has also taught at El Colegio de Mexico, uh, also at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in, uh, in uh, Geneva, and he also uh, worked uh, for, for four years uh, as a senior economist uh, at the World Bank uh, some time ago. Um, and Jeffrey Schott, um, whom uh, all of you know very well, of course, uh, joined the Peterson Institute for International Economics in 1983 and is a senior fellow working on international trade policy and economic sanctions. Uh, during his tenure at the Institute, uh, he was also a visiting lecturer at Princeton University and an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. He has also uh, been a senior associate at Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and an official of the U.S. Treasury Department in International Trade and Energy Policy. Uh, during the Tokyo round, um, uh, Jeff was a member of the U.S. delegation that negotiated the GATT subsidies code, and since January 2003, he has been a member of the Trade and Environment Policy Advisory Committee of the U.S. government. He is also a member uh, of the Advisory Committee on International Economic Policy of the U.S. Department of uh, State. And actually, these bios, uh, you know, uh, uh, do not make, do not uh, recognize the full uh, uh, scope of, uh, of uh, wisdom and expertise of our two panelists today. So, uh, with those uh, words, I hope that I uh, that I got uh, everyone very excited. And let me just uh, give the floor now to uh, Patrick um, for for some uh, 15 minutes, and then I'll ask uh, Jeff to take the mic. And then we'll open it up for uh, questions and comments uh, from the audience. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, this is the first for me, and I'll try not to upset my friend Jeff too much. Um, so I, I'm going to just, basically four things I want to talk about very briefly. One is value chains, what we're actually talking about. Uh, the second is the WTO, what we, what we've got to say about the WTO. The third is the mega regionals. And the fourth is, what, what, what possibly should we think about as the way forward? 
So I think what I've got to say about the, the global value change is pretty well known and pretty obvious, and I don't need to dwell on it. I mean, it's a very rapidly changing panorama. Uh, it's a very different world. You see it in terms of trade when you look at the in intermediates and you look at how these, these value chains are configured, uh, where they're located, and, and how they're operated. And we look at the, tariffs, the, the, the tariff structure, and we see that tariffs have increasingly become rather irrelevant in all this picture, and the old idea of trade being all about liberalizing at the border is, is becoming very passe, and we really need to worry about regulations. So I think it is a different world. This vertical integration does create a different set of challenges, a different set of interests in terms of, of integration. And there are, there are issues about inclusion and exclusion, but fundamentally it has, it has changed the way we think about trade and investment in the last couple of decades, in, in my view. And maybe that is reflected to some extent in all these negotiations which don't seem to be going anywhere very fast. The WTO, I mean, can we still think of the WTO in any foreseeable future as a credible institution for doing business? People like me who've been there a very long time were always of the view, or always at least expressed the view, that it would be okay, it just took time, there was a lot of inefficiencies, but it would sort itself out and people would see reason and be sensible. I think it's become much harder to, to say that convincingly. It raises some quite important questions about what the alternatives are. Maybe the trade liberalization per se, that agenda is no longer quite so vital. Maybe, that's a hypothesis I think worth discussing. But the WTO has done some, quite other, some other things that are quite important, and, and there's every reason for arguing, in my view, that they still can and still should. There has to be a mothership somewhere where everyone can go to, and if you take it for granted and don't think about it and let it wither and die, I think that we'll all rue the day. It's got its dispute settlement function. It's got its, its, its basically sets and, and administers certain rules. I think to just say goodbye to all that would be very problematic. And yet, if there's no negotiating function worth speaking of, this is a very real possibility. So, so, so I worry about that. Um, and I can't, I'll come back to that right at the end. But right now, I don't think we can count on WTO for anything much. Certainly not in the negotiating field, and certainly not in terms of, of pushing forward the agenda that was, was, was laid down at the beginning of the 21st century, a long time ago. Well, what about the mega-regionals? The mega-regionals are an ex exciting new thing that everyone is talking about. They are a different animal, in my view, from the, from the dozens and dozens of, of preferential trade agreements around the world to which WTO members, on average, belong to 13 each. I mean, it's, a, it's an extraordinary network. It's not rocket science to argue that this is not the best, best way of doing business. But again, it would be interesting to analyze what the real problems are with that structure. With the mega-regionals, I, I must say I'm a little more concerned. I don't think they're a panacea. I don't think they're, going to, they're not proving easy to do, and I think there are very good reasons for that. And I think the risks of exclusion are real, and the risks of regulatory divergence are real. I mean, we've always talked about trade... trade uh, I mean, even so with TPP, we can see some traditional uh, uh, trade diversion will take place. And I think that's um, an, an, an indicative of the fact that tariffs are not completely out of the picture because most of those calculations are done just on tariffs. But there's the regulatory stuff that worries me. And, on that, in, and in that light, I mean, I, I think that we can't... You see, some people say we've got these three big mega-regionals. You've got, you've got TPP, you've got TTIP, and you've got RCEP. Well, the people around here don't seem to think RCEP matters much and doesn't get mentioned much. I think that's a mistake, but I'll say why in a minute. Um, but, you know, the, each of these things are very, very different animals. TPP is not really out of the mold of traditional trade negotiations. It, it, it's, it's going deeper. It's putting emphasis in places with, that where emphasis has not been put before, certainly not in, the, in, a, in a multilateral context. But essentially, it's about getting more market access and getting more integration and taking care of interests uh, around issues like data and, and, and intellectual property and so on. And very much about investment too. So, so but, but these, we can kind of, I kind of think of them as being part of the same genre of concerns that have been on our agendas for many, many years, including in the WTO. TTI, TTIP is a very different animal. If you think of trade, traditional trade negotiations, 
you think of, well, this, we're supposed to be doing this for consumers, and we'll have some howling from the producers. But TTIP is going to push it the other way. It's going to be, we're going to do it for the producers because they'd really like to see some harmonization and some regulatory coherence, and it's going to be the consumers who squeal. So we shouldn't think of this as a traditional trade agreement. It is primarily, 85% of it is about regulation, it's about regulatory coherence, it's about trying to put together a seamless trail, in that sense you could say it's about trade, but it's about a lot more than trade, in, in, in my view. And I, and I think that it, it's going to be extremely difficult to do, at least part of this is, is rooted in ethical uh, values, the, the, the differences in regulatory approaches. At least some of it is um, different attitudes towards risk. I wonder whether this can ever be brought together in, in any form of harmonization or mutual recognition. And then there's the other stuff where I think there really is scope. But the, the, the discussions, I mean, the problem with all of these things, by the way, is they're all done in secret. And so most of us, most of us, some of, I'm sh of you, I'm sure, are in the know. But most of us just have to end up guessing and, and, and getting a few crumbs from the table when it comes to information. But it, it seems to me that, the, that these guys are having real difficulty making any uh, real pr progress at all. And if they can't do it, then it raises questions about what we really think about regulatory environment the regulatory environment, particularly in an international setting. And I think maybe, uh, you know, one of the thoughts that's been going through my mind is, are we actually trying to do the wrong thing? You know, we're trying to negotiate everything. We're trying to put everything down in really hard legal language that's justiciable. Have we got it right? Have we got the balance right? We can have legal obligations. We can have litigation. But there's something in between which may make a difference to the effectiveness of those other two functions. And I'm not sure we've thought about that carefully enough. And, you know, to the extent that we talk about the WTO and the gap before it having a lot of problems in, in dealing with very diverse countries and very diverse economies with very strongly different interests, there's always been this sort of overlay of, well, it's a bit of coercion here, a bit of coercion there. We don't really buy in. I'm wondering whether the buy-in isn't something that has to be homegrown. And I'm wondering whether we don't put too much into the basket of trade liberalization when we should actually be putting it in the basket of we want to be competitive, we want to join the world economy. It's not just about opening a market to foreigners. It's about getting it right. And I think that conversation is, is missing from a lot of the discussions that, that we've been having. And, and in part, I think, explains why some of these agreements are, are, are kind of stuck. My final point in the 30 seconds that I have left is that I really don't and I don't think this is, some, some nasty people said that I only would make this argument because my pension is located in the WTO. But honestly, I think that the, the world is going to be a very sorry place without a WTO. And you try to reconstruct that today, and I, I'd say good luck to you. So whatever, is, whatever it takes, I can see different reasons but I, for wanting the WTO, I can see different reasons for supporting it, depending where a, a country sits on the growth stakes and, and all sorts of other ways. But I can't see any rational reason why anyone would say, let's just get rid of the damn thing. So there's failure here. What are you going to do about this failure? And what is the new architecture going to look like? We're going to have these mega regions, and we should have the WTO. I'll stop there. Thank you. Oh, I'm so sorry about RCEP. I forgot about RCEP. I'm as bad as all of you about RCEP. RCEP, don't underestimate RCEP. RCEP also has a very different agenda. RCEP is not, well, it depends who you talk to, actually. If you talk to the more powerful economies, the larger economies, the, the industrial economies, they'll say, yeah, it's just another FTA. We want, we want liberalization, we want access. But a lot of the others are saying, no, 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 no. It's not just about that. This is, about, this is genuinely about creating economic an economic community and if in creating an economic community we've got to talk about infrastructure we've got to talk about coherence at many different levels let's just forget about the trade liberalization for now and create an operating environment in which we can all glean benefits now you can't make that separation quite so starkly in my view but i do think that it's something to watch especially since one of the problems of mega regions which i didn't go into but i think is self-evident is that the geopolitics of these things are actually not very conducive to making good policy in a, in a trade sense. And you see these tensions. I mean, these ten the geopolitics is born in no small part from big power tensions and shifts in power 
uh, and influence. And, and so you get that you see it in the Asian Infrastructure Bank, where you say, why boycott a bank? I'm sure you'll find some rationale, but I'm not sure why you do that. IMF, why don't you recognize that IMF needs reforming? Um, TISA, the Chinese asked to join TISA. The original rationale for the TISA was that, and I'm winding you up now, the original, uh, the original justification for TISA was that the, these other guys, these emerging economies, wouldn't, stand, wouldn't step up to the plate. Well, they have the third plenum in Beijing, and then they want to step up to the plate, and they say, we want to be part of this. And they're told no. So I, I don't know. I, I think we've got to rethink some of this as well. So now that you told me to talk about RCEF, I've talked about the geopolitics as well. But I've done. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Jeff? Well, thank you. Patrick never disappoints. I'm going to rip up my notes and uh, <laughs> just comment on what he said. Um, uh, Actually, I was going to focus my remarks on uh, the mega regionals and how they address the evolving forms of multilateral trade cooperation uh, that, that Patrick has just discussed. Uh, and maybe I'll start off with my assessment of the mega regionals, uh, which is slightly different from, uh, from Patrick. Actually, in some ways, very different from Patrick's. Why would that be? Why would that be? Um, I think he is, is right in classifying the TPP as a more traditional uh, trade negotiation. Uh, if you can consider a trade negotiation uh, that has such an extensive and comprehensive agenda among 12 countries to be traditional, we really haven't seen that uh, take place anywhere else. Uh, and so it has been unique, uh, and it has been deemed to be valuable by the countries participating. And one evidence of that is that countries have asked to join as the negotiations were taking place and were admitted to the uh, uh, negotiations while they were uh, in train. Uh, you don't see that in trade negotiations uh, uh, very often. Um, it's added a different dynamic. Uh, it's encouraged, now that Fred's here, the spirit of competitive liberalization. And in fact, many countries have either joined the TPP or are s seriously uh, uh, studying the, and weighing the benefits and potential challenges of TPP participation uh, because of their concern uh, about not really trade diversion but investment diversion. Uh, and so there is this competitive uh, liberalization ethic that is being spurred, which I think in a way goes to your, uh, 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 goes against the, the, the point that you had that countries aren't doing, uh, aren't having homegrown reasons for uh, uh, pursuing these mega regionals. I think in the TPP context, uh, many of the countries are there because they ne know that they need to boost productivity, uh, uh, increase their competitiveness in a very dynamic region. Uh, the, um, uh, I think uh, Patrick is exactly right to say it's, uh, uh, there are some enhancements to the international trade agenda being discussed in TPP, uh, but the focus is on more integration, more market access, uh, and, and, in, in many, uh, and in the many uh, traditional areas of uh, the early WTO years. Uh, uh, but including investment, which is not been on the uh, forefront of the WTO agenda, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, on TTIP, I'm actually much more pessimistic at this point than Patrick, uh, because the headlines and, and the, uh, the boilerplate uh, from, from policymakers is that TTIP is going to be this innovative regulatory uh, negotiation or become a regulatory laboratory. And it ain't happening. Uh, and suddenly all the traditional problems that have beset transatlantic uh, economic negotiations over the past two decades are resurfacing. And uh, they ha uh, uh, unfortunately, rather than treat this as an innovative new type of negotiation, the negotiators have treated it like a traditional FTA. And uh, uh, this is something that my colleagues and I are, are doing a new paper on here at the Institute. Hopefully, we'll be out in a few weeks. 
uh, trying to reflect on a possible mid-course uh, mid correction uh, for the TTIP talks uh, uh, when, after the smoke clears from the change in the EU Commission and uh, the results of the midterm elections tomorrow are digested. Uh, uh, so that's, that's an important point. Patrick is absolutely right that there is a central problem with different ethical values and risk, risk assessments, and that, I think, is plaguing the ability to move forward on the regulatory agenda. I think he's hit the nail on the head on that one. Uh, on RCEP, I'm one of the skeptics. Uh, and not because of the points that Patrick made. I think he's exactly right on building an economic community, uh, but in essence that means deepening economic integration among the ASEAN countries. Uh, because the integration efforts between the ASEAN countries and the other six uh, participants in the RCEP are not pr proceeding that quickly. I think India has been a big drag on this negotiation since it started and continues to be and uh, has essentially diminished the potential economic value uh, of, of the RCEP to many of the countries and I think this has led uh, some of the other major countries to have lower expectations on what the RCEP can do. So, slightly different view uh, on, on the mega regionals, uh, but one point that I think bears emphasis is the uh, focus on investment. I think when one talks about mega regional trade agree uh, arrangements, it, it's somewhat of a misnomer. For most participants, a primary objective uh, is to encourage investment. Uh, now, this may seem odd because for many developing countries, they long ago ruled uh, many important investment issues off the WTO agenda. Uh, and this has been a colossal blunder that has impeded the ability to craft a meaningful Doha round package in Geneva and allowed some of those developing countries to maintain restrictive and ultimately self-defeating investment policies. Now interestingly, some astute policymakers recognized this problem and reverse course by seeking to undertake more comprehensive investment ob obligations uh, in these mega regional uh, ta uh, packs with the United States and others. Uh, most notable of this is the TPP, and uh, I think for many of the developing country participants in the TPP, the investment provisions will be very important. But the TPP isn't the only pact that uh, has moved the investment uh, uh, policy agenda forward. And uh, I think it is worth looking also at the trilateral investment agreement that was signed in uh, May of 2012 between China, Japan, and Korea uh, that goes a lot further than most of the investment agreements among Asian countries. Now for these countries, the key is to, is to mix a policy cocktail uh, that provides one uh, greater predi predictability over time, that removes distortions to trade and investment in goods and services that constrain productivity growth, and that encourages infrastructure investment to facilitate access to markets uh, and to reduce costs associated with transportation, finance, and marketing of goods and services. In some, that reduces transaction costs. Uh, that's why Vietnam is at the TPP table. Uh, they know they face intense competition from China. They know they're benefiting in the short term from uh, 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 investment that has left China because of cost reasons, uh, but they won't maintain that advantage unless they improve productivity in their economy. Uh, and I think that's why other uh, RCEP countries are looking closely at the potential benefits and challenges of participating uh, in TPP in the future, including China, uh, which is interesting, but I think not surprising if you consider the new policy reforms that are being implemented uh, pursuant to the third party plenum. Uh, in which TPP obligations in some areas could complement and even reinforce what uh, uh, Chinese policymakers are trying to do at home. 
Uh, this is in some ways very similar uh, to the motivation of China to join the WTO in the 1990s. Uh, so uh, in this sense, uh, I, I, I think it's important to look at investment as, as helping to promote the type of in, at down-home uh, uh, objectives to, to improve competitiveness uh, that we often don't see in negotiating sessions uh, in the WTO in Geneva. Now, there are a couple of other things in my final minute or two on mega regionals that I think uh, are, are, are useful. Uh, mega regionals, particularly the TPP and potentially TTIP, uh, if policymakers listen to the advice from the Peterson Institute in the future, uh, sometimes happens. Uh, I think mega regionals are important laboratories for developing new disciplines in areas like uh, investment and competition policy, uh, new rules on state-owned enterprises, not the prohibition of state-owned enterprises, but constraints on, on, on uh, the types of, of, of support that they get that, that uh, create an uh, unlevel playing field. Uh, rules on e-commerce, on data flows, as, da as, as Gary mentioned earlier. Megas are, mega regionals are also moving in the right direction by promoting enhanced transparency of public policy and regulatory proceedings and diluting restrictive content requirements, though and so, there's always some aspect of a, of a pushback in that as one gets to the end game negotiations in particular sectors. Uh, now, uh, a final, final point. Uh, mega regionals could support parallel plurilateral negotiations on services, on information technology products, on environmental goods. They could build support for new initiatives like a local content requirements code that Gary and I and Kathleen Cimino and others have, have, have uh, uh, proposed uh, a year or so ago. But the record to date indicates negotiators are fumbling the ball in several of these areas and are not using the negotiations, are not developing a strategy to use the negotiations to support multilateral trade, uh, the, the, the rebuilding of multilateral trade negotiations. If there is any chance for a renaissance of WTO trade negotiations, it will likely require the agglomeration of these plurilaterals with core Doha initiatives but so far, this idea seems too broad for the narrow tunnel vision of many Geneva uh, trade diplomats. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let me now uh, open it up for, uh, for questions and uh, comments. Uh, there's a mic in the center, and if you care to identify yourself uh, and uh, pose your, your question or make your comment to uh, both or either Patrick and uh, Jeff. Good afternoon, thank you very much. Um, Dave Nelson with GE. Uh, my, my question, uh, Mr. Lowe, is, is thank you for um, highlighting the new issue of, of global value change, which you described as, as a kind of a big change in the way the world economy functions. But I'm trying to understand a little more clearly the link between that new situation and the mega regionals. And I wonder if you could spell out how the, the rise of global value chains is affected by or should affect the negotiating strategy in the mega regionals. I think Jeff uh, touched on it briefly in his comment about the um, possibility for local content requirement clauses in it, but those aren't being dealt with. So if you could elaborate on that issue, I'd appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, shall we take a couple of questions and then we'll come back to our, our, our panelists here. Um, Carolyn. Hi, I'm Carolyn Freund from the Peterson Institute. My first question is actually related to that, which is with global value chains, one, one difference is there's actually an incentive for countries to unilaterally liberalize. And I think this kind of unilateralism hasn't really been discussed here. And actually, developing countries have liberalized primarily through unilateral liberalization and not through uh, multilateral negotiations over over the last uh, you know 20 years or so so I, I guess my question is why with, some, with respect to something Patrick said why can't we see the WTO as primarily a uh, rules keeper dispute settlement uh, uh, arbitra arbitrator 
and uh, supporting unilateral liberalization, plurilaterals where possible, but sort of slowing down on the multilateral for the, for the time being. Um, why isn't that, you know, why does that mean there's a demise of, of the WTO? Is it the bicycle kind of theory? And, and my other question, which I guess goes to Patrick as well, is about regulatory harmonization or mutual recognition, which um, he made an interesting point, which was that this is good for producers, but not for consumers. And I guess I'm having trouble seeing why it's not good for consumers. You know, when, when I forget to bring my charger for my phone, it's always hard to find someone who has the same charger. Or when uh, you travel to Europe, you have to bring that, that plug. This is what the issue is about. It's about cars, you know, a Ford Fusion is only 80% the same parts in the US and Europe. Imagine the lower prices, increased variety, and there's not a diversion there because cars can come if third countries are able to also benefit from this, you could have cars going to both markets uh, much more seamlessly. So there's variety, lower prices, et cetera. So I just want to push you a bit on where these, we, these losses are and how likely they are. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, Sherry, you'd like to pose your question as well. Thank you. Thank you, Annabelle. Uh, Sherry Stevenson from the ICTSD Geneva. Um, Thanks for this panel, it's a really excellent initiative, and to Patrick and Jeff. I want to take up something that Patrick alluded to, which I think is important for us to reflect on, and uh, you didn't go into it too much detail, Patrick, but I know you've been thinking about this, and that's the fact that the negotiating function of the WTO isn't really working uh, right now, it hasn't been working well for the past um, several years, and should we be thinking of an alternative way of going about this so that the WTO isn't completely moribund and completely irrelevant, but on the other hand, maybe can do things in slightly different way and yet still achieve a positive impact for its members? And I, I was struck by what you said, that you know we should be thinking more, uh, emphasizing that our ultimate goal is, is enhanced competitiveness for all countries. And that trade liberalization in and of itself is clearly, you know, not actually the major issue on the table today. And that's absolutely true in so many ways. Could we not think about what APEC has done as a model for potentially transpose, transposing or transporting into the WTO? APEC has been tremendously successful through approaching the question of trade liberalization from a point of view of not just market opening, but also enhanced competitiveness and getting countries to better understand what is their, their, their you know, ultimate best interest in moving forward with policy reform. And they've done this in a variety of different ways that have been all kind of mutually uh, reinforcing, some more or less successful, but they've all been interesting. One is, of course, the, the emphasis on capacity building from the start, the second is the use of peer reviews. You might say the WTO has that in the trade policy review, but you know this is a little bit more intensive. Um, the, the use of, of non-binding instruments agreed by all APEC members, but that set targets as opposed to you know, actual binding treaty obligations, such as menus of options, which they've used in the investment area, the services area, and other areas. Um, developing model measures, and then developing and agreeing upon specific targets, which are targets for competitiveness, such as reducing trade facilitation costs by 15% by X date. These kind of things. Could the WTO actually do that and then kind of draw along countries? Or, or maybe, Patrick, you could tell us what you're thinking at, of in terms of, of other soft law approaches, potentially, that might replace the hard law functioning that the way the WTO has been functioning and doesn't seem to be functioning well. And Jeff, just one very, very quick comment on what you said. Um, perhaps most of the plurilateral initiatives right now are not um, 
thinking or their participants are not thinking about how to revitalize. The WTO is part of what they're doing. But I do think there is one exception, and I think that's the TISA negotiations, the Trade and Services Agreement negotiations. And if you look at the way the draft agreement is actually structured in the modular form that they've set out, the four-part modular form, it's structured specifically in such a way that can be, it can be brought into the WTO once concluded, and rather than contradicting the existing GATS, actually complement it, reinforce it, and simply provide an additional and updated uh, set of disciplines and market opening, which hopefully, ideally, members would then apply on a multilateral MFN basis. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Sherry. So, uh, Patrick, you care to uh, start? I can't, I'm not sure I can remember all the questions. I mean, I think that the, the, the GVC world and what, what does it mean for, me, for mega regionals, I mean, I think part of what Carolyn said is, 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 is partly the answer. If you want to be part of these, depending, of course, on the sector, depending on, your, on, 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 on where power resides, you are, you are going to want to create an environment which is, is more likely to attract participation, especially if you're talking about those kinds of value chains which don't begin in your country because of a natural resource base that you may or may not get a bit of the action. You're going to have a, definitely have an incentive. I guess my concern about the, and this is more of a research question, partly because we don't know what's in these agreements, is to what extent are we doing the necessary on the, on, in, in the area of uh, regulation? Are we, you see, I don't, I don't really subscribe in any near future to a vision in which the, the, the two or the three mega regionals, depending on how you want to look at it, will coalesce and, and out of which will be born the new WTO and all those excluded countries will pop in and say thank you for all that. We can start again and we've got a, 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 a fundamentally non-discriminatory equal opportunity charter for trade. So, so if you don't believe that, then I, I do think that um, you, you, if you want to understand what's happening to production, at least part of it has to be what, are, what is happening on regulation. And, you know, it's going to be tougher and tougher the more embedded these things become. I mean, we started looking at stuff in China. You'll be, I mean, you wouldn't be surprised, but China has diverged quite significantly in important areas of regulation. How are you going to fix that? So, so I see that as a, as a, as a, as a genuine uh, problem, and, and, but again, I think it's more of a research question. Um, I, I think, Carolyn on, on, Carolyn, on the question of what the WTO's role has been, I've always been a, a great fan of the idea that the WTO and the GATT has not been a great agent of liberalization. If you really take the record apart, you'll see industrial tariffs in industrial countries where the, the, the WTO, the GATT, was largely a coordination uh, body for that because the, the momentum was there, the determination was there, the decisions were there. To some extent, it was a terms of trade story, so you needed that coordination at the beginning. But when we look at other areas where we could talk about trade liberalization in the old sense, in the traditional sense, what have they done in services? Really very little. What have they done in agriculture? Really very little. What have developing countries done? If you take out the ITA, no developing country, other than when they've been, been nego uh, negotiating their accession, has ever reduced an MFN applied rate on the altar of a GATT WTO negotiation. So when you put all that together, you can't help say, but, you know, we've always been saying that we're the guys who do the market opening, but I think that's false advertising, which has done the, the GATT WTO no good at all. The real value of the WTO is precisely what you said, consolidation, drawing the line, banking, coordinating, and providing a, a forum for settling disputes, which has actually done rather well historically. So I would, I would really want to see that kind of more imaginative thinking about how we can save the WTO and accept that we might be able to shift across to best practices in different mega regionals for some of the stuff that could be banked there and stop fretting over why we can't liberalize trade. I mean, the, the Doha round was more intensive in trade liberalization than anything since, I don't know, certainly not certainly not the uh, Tokyo round, certainly not the Uruguay round, maybe the Kennedy round, but I'm not sure. So, so in, in that world, is it such a surprise that we ran up, we, we hit, a, hit a brick wall if we think that it, it, you can do suddenly, all of a sudden, in this world that's become much more complicated, we can just do trade liberalization in this way? And while we're on, the, while we're on that, I think that um, the, the WTO will not go anywhere in any shape or form unless it does something about its decision-making procedures. We can't continue with the threat of 
de facto veto over every damn thing, and not even veto that you really have to explain, and not even a veto of what's on the table. I'm vetoing what's on the table, not because I don't like it. It's because I care more about something that you won't do for me. This is not how the WTO is ever going to do business satisfactorily. So there's got to be a fundamental change. My only point is that if we don't have the WTO, Jeff doesn't even mention the WTO, I notice. I, I, just, I just wonder how it's all going to come together in a world which, with more or less degree of integration, is going to be, stay integrated unless something really goes bad. So, so I think that's what I would say about, about all that. Um, of course, I was being a little bit flip when I said about the consumers and the producers. And the, it's true for part of what's on the table and not true for another part. I guess my point is, if, they, if they're not careful and they build this as a trade liberalization exercise, they will fail like the MAA, MAI failed. It's not just about trade liberalization. It's about other things too. And there are consumer sensitivities, and they need to be dealt with, and they very well need, need, may need to be set aside and say, you know, there are limits we have nation states, we have boundaries, we're not going to get rid of them in, 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 in all circumstances, something like that. But, I, but you, you're right to, take, to, to uh, call me up on that because clearly there are producer interests in those areas which are probably doable and which consumers would quite like too. So, so I, I stand corrected on this sort of more crass characterization, but there is an important element of, 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 of potential serious potential consumer resistance which will kill it. Um, the APEC model, yeah, I mean, I was, I was sort of hinting at that. I mean, I'm not sure how it, we don't want to get all mushy and irrelevant. <laughs> so if we have this sort of soft approach to what is fundamentally a, a legally binding agreement, I think we've got to construct it really well, but I do think there's space for it. And I think that the soft law elements, at least some of them, and that's something we'd have to think about a bit harder, would be on a road to somewhere else. It would be more of a, you know, I know the political scientists hate constructivism. They think it's, it's, there's something wet about it. But I'm a bit of a constructivist. I think if you can talk to people, when I talk to Jeff and try to understand what he's saying, I think only half of it's rubbish, having started out thinking it was all rubbish. So, I mean, yeah. there is space, there's space for that kind of, 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 of conversation and that kind of understanding, that kind of relation. I think it's done APEC extremely well. I don't dis APEC. I think they've done some really interesting things. But we've got to get the balance. Actually, on that last point, Patrick and I agree on, on almost everything uh, he's, he's just said. And the last point uh, brings up an, an interesting point. Have the lawyers hurt the WTO? Absolutely. Uh, and... Uh, in the old days, going back to the medieval period of, 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 of the Tokyo round, uh, when negotiators wanted to compromise, they figured out a way to do so. And there wasn't the concern that lawyers would parse every word and you'd be brought to the bench and uh, before the bench and, and held accountable for everything. You were able to craft solutions to, to negotiate solutions to problems in a practical way. Now, the lawyers draft very intricate language as an opening negotiating position. Uh, and developing countries are understandably defensive when they come up and they say, well, we've got to worry that uh, we may get run afoul of something. And uh, instead of having benefits from the trade agreement, we may have some of our previous benefits pulled back. Um, and so, uh, it, 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 it's an interesting question on how you calibrate the, the extent of the binding of uh, nature of dispute settlement and the, and the force of the international obligation under negotiation. And that is actually taking place today in the TPP, uh, in the environmental chapter. Uh, some of you may have heard me talk about this uh, uh, before. Uh, but the United States was the only country among the 12 in the TPP that want binding dispute settlement in the environmental chapter. Uh, and the U.S. has insisted upon it because Congress has insisted for many years that there be this uh, a common dispute settlement uh, approach to all of the obligations. Uh, 
Uh, but as a result, the negotiators have had to recalibrate the, the not as much the scope of the uh, uh, obligations, uh, but the way that they are framed and the nature of, 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 of the uh, hard law obligation. Uh, and uh, uh, that, I think, is going to continue to be a, a problem play, play, uh, plaguing trade negotiations for some time. Um, uh, I, I, I agree with, uh, with, with Patrick's characterization of how things have operated or, or, or the growing dysfunction of the Geneva negotiating process. Uh, and certainly that was evident at Bali until uh, the agreement was reached and then that agreement was voided uh, by one country. Uh, uh, so. Uh, it, uh, the way he described it made me think he was describing how the U.S. Congress doesn't work, uh, because it's exactly the same type of thing, holding I, I extraneous. Don't, I don't want to make too many enemies in one go. Right, but, uh, but actually, if you compare the Congress to the WTO, I'm not sure who you're insulting. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, okay, uh, that was a bit flip. Uh, uh, f final final, final uh, 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 point on, on, on this, on, on services. Uh, Patrick made a point earlier on, uh, on uh, China entering into, into the TISA. Uh, and I think it's very important uh, if China, Chinese officials want to use TISA to complement and reinforce the reforms that they have begun to undertake uh, in, in this area. It's, it's proceeding incrementally. Uh, but I think it would be a good thing. Uh, my impression is, is that U.S. officials are rather cautious because of the experience uh, of Chinese participation in the information technology agreement uh, negotiations. Uh, and uh, they are using uh, the withholding of, of support for Chinese participation in TISA as leverage to try to induce a better deal uh, in the ITA. Now we may, that we'll see in the next uh, week or two if that strategy yields results. Uh, if it does, we might have a breakthrough in ITA and the ability for China to join the TISA. I don't know. Uh, uh, but uh, 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 certainly uh, if China joined the TISA, uh, it would create a lot of pressures on India and Brazil to do so as well. And then uh, uh, TISA could really be an MFN uh, uh, negotiation. Uh, uh, Sherry's point is, is, is correct on that uh, with, with one uh, uh, slight amendment. Uh, my criticism was not of the nature of the TISA and its, and its ability to be transported or back into the multilateral, into the Geneva agenda. Uh, my criticism was that the mega regional negotiators are not using their uh, consultative and negotiating uh, time uh, to build up the TISA and improve it faster, and to use that as a strategy for improving TISA so that you can uh, 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 facilitate that transition from plurilateral to multilateral. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions and, uh, and comments? And maybe um, while we get one, let me, let me ask uh, both of you. Um, we've been talking a little bit about services, but, uh, and I know, Patrick, that you've been working uh, on, uh, on global value chain. So I'd like to ask you, what role, what is the role of services in, uh, in global value chains? How important uh, are they? And, uh, and how do you think uh, trade policy and trade, uh, uh, trade negotiations uh, could facilitate the operation of uh, global value chains? Uh, is this something that could be uh, an important driver of growth uh, in going forward? Yeah, I mean, I, this is something that I'm spending most of my time on these days uh, at the Fung Global Institute. It's the, it's the role of services in production, trade, and consumption, particularly in, GVC, in the GVC world. And essentially, the, 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 the premise is that for historical reasons to do with classical economic thought, because of the Baumol disease literature, and because data is really hard to get in services, we, we have dreadfully neglected services as a source of value. 
We know that services are the, create the, the bulk of value in national income. We're increasingly learning that this is probably true in, uh, in trade as well, although when we use the value-added database that's available, we get a number of about 45% as the share, having jumped from 23% as what we used to say for years. Um, but actually, there's still a lot of services embedded in, 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 in goods that, that get into the trade statistics. Once you start thinking about where the value is generated and who generates it, services become extraordinarily important across the board, and yet how much do we know about them? We do know that services are more heavily regulated and there's more protectionism in services than in any other segment of, of, the, of the economy. We know that there's all these complications, but we've done very little about it. I think if you're thinking of how to manage services in a GVC world, then of course the other reality is that a lot of the potential outsourcing of, of, of activities will be services activities. If you're thinking about how to use GVCs as a developmental tools and, 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 and look for a scope for integration, Services, when services are bundled, when services are bundled with goods, I mean, how the way business does it, and they make product offerings, some services which we would normally think of being absolutely impossible to trade, they would be non-tradable, are tradable. And if you can make a whole new chunk of your economy tradable and think of it in those terms, that all the advantages of trade are forthcoming. So I think these are things that have been badly neglected in business, in policy analysis, and in, 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 and in government policy. And I think there's plenty of scope for thinking differently about services and their role and managing a whole new approach to how we should deal with them. And one of the first things I would do, and this is, I'm glad my friend Hamid Mamdou is not here because he's the man in the WTO who runs the services division. I personally would start looking very actively for ways for killing distinctions between goods and services in economic discourse and in policy and in policy work. Because at the end of the day, when you look at how these GVCs work, there's only one thing that meaningfully distinguishes goods and services, and it's not that important. It's, it's tangibility. So we call a chair a good simply because it has physical form. But a chair is a service. It gives you sitting services. Why don't we call it a service? because it's got physical form. You could go on endlessly like this, but I, mean, I really think there's a very serious question here about why we treat goods and services in this, in this siloed fashion. And of course, investment and all sorts of other things go with that argument. I think we've got to rethink this, and I don't think the megas are doing it for us, and the WTO is certainly nowhere near doing that, but if we're talking about fresh thinking, I think this is one of the things that would be worth trying to think about a bit more carefully. All right, uh, we, uh, we have a queue here, so uh, I'll give the floor to, uh, to Gary now uh, for next question. Uh, well, our two panelists are old enough to remember both the Cold War and Herman Kahn thinking the unthinkable. So let's have them think for a few moments about the unthinkable. Suppose TPP and TTIP crash and the WTO continues to you know, flounder around. What is the system? What, what's the next step in the system if that happens? Now, I'm not worried about David Nelson and uh, GE. I think it can take care of itself. But there are a lot of other companies in the world who are not quite as big as GE. Thank you, uh, Gary. Let us take a question. Christine. Uh, my name is Christine Chang, and I work in the Investment Climate and Business Regulation Unit in Annabelle's Global Practice at the World Bank. Uh, the question is really for uh, both Patrick and Jeffrey. I think you both mentioned uh, the risks of a regulatory divergence and also regulatory laboratory, uh, you know, coming from the mega regional, uh, uh, you know, agreements. Uh, so I'm just wondering uh, what could be, uh, oh, you also mentioned actually the importance of investment for the competitiveness agenda. Uh, so my question is, uh, what is a practical mechanism that developing countries can actually join the global kind of rule setting forum uh, to really uh, look at you know, certain investment like policy or competition policy agenda that is not really taken on by WTO yet as the trade agenda. Uh, so that there is a kind of an international agreement, not necessarily legally binding, uh, 
um, but as you know, good principles or, or, or whatever you want to call them, uh, so that you know uh, you don't have you know the kind of the reversion that you were describing. That you know uh, maybe midterm uh, we need to revise them, uh, but taking into account uh, you know the developing countries, the, the regulatory enforceability, and really the weak capacity there, so that you have some international rulemaking uh, in the sense uh, that they can also you know promote uh, domestic autonomous. Uh, reforms in those countries, but not necessarily in a legally binding way. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, Roberto Echandi. I'm in the same team, Annabelle and Christine. I have two concrete questions. Uh, you are talking about the importance of investment, and in the evolution of international economic law during the last 15 years, in the investment field, there has been even more activism than in the trade field. Uh, we have a web of uh, what is called international investment agreements, as you know. Not only the BITs, but as you know, the BITs that traditionally were focused on protection, there's, there's, an, there's an investment rule making that now some of the BITs at the US, Canada, now the EU, uh, even Japan, even Vietnam, all supply to establishment of investment. So the fact of what we're beginning to see is that in the investment area, you are having a lot of uh, very interesting rulemaking that rather than going to a concentrated approach like in a WTO, you have a web and through the MFN, you are beginning to have a fragmented system that is very chaotic, but at the same time is leveling the playing field to a great extent uh, uh, in investment protection and in some degrees in investment entry. So I would like to hear uh, 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 your views on whether actually we, uh, what I haven't seen yet is this integrated approach of what is the implication of WTO and these IAAs together? For example, we have made some analysis and today an investor can claim the application of a WTO discipline in an investor state arbitration. Whether that's good or not, that is very controversial, but what happens is that legally it's possible to happen. So my point here is, isn't that another avenue where we should think out of the box in integrating, if we're talking about international production, not also limiting then to the rulemaking on trade only, but also bring the investment dimension here. And the last point on that one, the last question was, in the investment field, they also have gone up well beyond the WTO or trade uh, in, the, in the following sense. Is in investment law the first time where the private sector has access to enforce any obligation? And that's a break of huge paradigms, right? Now, some people consider it good, some people consider it bad. And as you know, there's a big debate now on the increase of investor state disputes. Mind you, there's only 600 in 15 years. And if you consider the amount of investment in the world, 600 disputes, 50 disputes per year, I don't know. We, we could, some people will say that it's a lot. Some people might say that it's less. But the point that I want to make here is to what extent that breaks the part, I mean, that break of the paradigm of allowing the private sector to use the international system is something that we should also bring into the table. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, do you care to start uh, on this one? Uh, <laughs> thinking the unthinkable. Uh, I do that every day. I have a teenage daughter. Uh, um, so, um, so I have to, that, that's a challenge. I, 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 it's just a normal part of living for me. Um, but if talks fail, I think the political response will come well before the trade negotiating response because, uh, and you're already beginning to see this, uh, the biggest losers from a breakdown in the system or an increase in administered protection is the poorest countries. Uh, and you will see large segments of, of Africa, some parts of, South, of Asia and, and Latin America, uh, really uh, uh, being hurt. And to the extent that it will require a political response. You already see the Obama administration developing new Africa initiatives. Uh, I'm not, not sure uh, how integrated they are with the overall political and economic strategy of the region, but uh, 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 they recognize that there, that there is vulnerability. So I, I think that's what the first thing would happen. The, the big guys can take care of themselves, whether it be countries or, or, or multinationals, uh, but there would be a lot of, of people that would be hurt in very poor countries. Um, 
on the risk of, 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 of regulatory divergence and looking at more flexible ways of applying uh, disciplines, I don't think you can say, yes, one should be more flexible or no, one can't be more flexible. Uh, but the experience to date indicates to me that the flexibility that Sherry was talking about in APEC uh, hasn't produced results. Uh, and that it hasn't created enough policy predictability uh, to provide the assurances to investors that they will go in and 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 uh, 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 you know bring in money, bring in management uh, uh, talent, uh, uh, and make make uh, a medium to long term commitment to uh, to to the country. Uh, now, the investment rules are only one part of it. Uh, the investment climate is determined by a lot of other things. Ted Moran has, has written extensively on that. Uh, uh, so a trade agreement is not, is, is, is not the thing that's going to drive investment. Uh, but it can complement and, and support uh, the other domestic reforms uh, underway in, in, in the country. And uh, so I would, I would just say, uh, if, if there's too much wiggle room uh, that uh, countries can raise or lower barriers, change regulations, there's too much corruption, too much favoritism for, for local interests, that's, that's uh, not going to help whether you have, you know, soft rules. Uh, uh, and uh, finally, on, on, on the extent of rulemaking, new rulemaking in the investment area, I think the point is very well taken. Uh, it's not been happening in the WTO, except to a limited extent in services. Um, and uh, it has been going on in the mega regionals and in some other bilaterals. Uh, many of the bilaterals, uh, the extent of investment disciplines are rather weak. Uh, they, they're a starting point, but not perhaps sufficient enough to, to give that policy predictability that I was just talking about. Uh, the TPP template is a little more rigorous, and that's why I, 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 I suggested that as, as a possible template, um, but not the only one. And that's why I also said look at the China-Japan-Korea uh, agreement, which is making a, is a halfway house, but going further than the ASEAN countries have gone, for example. Uh, finally, on, on, on private right of action, uh, I am a little concerned about ISDS uh, going forward. Uh, not that on balance it isn't a good idea, but I don't think you can say that the past performance is an indicator of future uh, action, particularly when one's looking at the uh, use of uh, regulations to support climate change objectives, uh, which has begun to increase concerns about, uh, about investor uh, litigation. Uh, I think there are ways to, to craft protections against frivolous litigation or overzealous litigation uh, uh, to maintain that private right of action. Uh, but I, I'm also a little hesitant to extend that private right of action throughout the, the, the trading system uh, for fear that it could uh, undercut national interests, which may be different from corporate or uh, individual constituent interests. Thank you. Uh, Patrick? Well, for you, it might be thinking the unthinkable. It might be thinking the desirable for me. No, I'm only kidding. But I, I, I do think that um, what's afflicting, what will make life difficult for the mega regionals is the same phenomenon that has made life difficult for the WTO. If the mega regionals go down and they, they come to nothing and the WTO remains dysfunctional, then I think we really are in trouble. But the question is, what political capital is, is expended in trying to make these things work? I, I, I don't for a moment doubt that it would be a lot harder to do that in the WTO. And if, if they can't do it in the mega regionals, then we're probably in very deep trouble. But my only point is, it's the same, it's the same commodity which is afflicting both, both all of those venues. And that, that is the, 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 an ability to think of this whole 
area of cooperation as more than just a zero-sum game when you're just fighting over who gets which chunk of the pie. And, and, and recognize that the cooperation is going to, is going to enlarge the pie, so it's a positive-sum game, and then try to work it from there. So, so I think that's one of the really frustrating things of the particular conjuncture we're in, in terms of international cooperation. It's not just trade, it's climate, it's financial architecture, it's use of resources, I mean, it's everywhere, and, and we're in a bad place in, in, that, in that sense. And, and so I think any of these things going down, however much you, dis, you whatever your relative view is of the different, of the merits of the different ones, any of this is very serious and, 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 and really not good news at all. And I, I, so, so that, that does worry me a lot. It is true that the big guys can take care of themselves, but that's going to make for a very ugly world. So that, that I think, is, is, is my response on, on that one. Um, one of the things that was attractive about the trade facilitation agreement, which will ne may never be, and that the WTO managed to put together, incidentally, in Bali, a close call, but you know what the core ingredient there was? It was that the United States and China worked together. A rare occurrence, but that's what clinched it. Now, what the attractive thing about that was that it had these provisions in there which really get us away from, ah, just open your market and we'll all be happy. It was, if you want to get the benefits from, the, from trade facilitation, we'll help you with, with we'll, we'll give you, we'll give you, we'll, we'll, there'll be some funding, there'll be resources, and, and it, it puts a whole different, it puts a whole different uh, kind of um, face on what you're trying to do. It becomes a shared endeavor, and not just, I want, it's not just uh, zero sum anymore. And, and I think that that was something that we, that finally the WTO was getting, and then it, it goes down in flames. So I'm, 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 I feel very, I think that's a, an additional thing that's a, a great uh, pity. Um, on the question of investment, I'm going to borrow from something that, that Christine said this morning in an earlier meeting in the, in the World Bank, that one of the nice things about investment, forget about all the rubbish that goes on in, in Geneva, is that... It's a, it, you get jobs from investment. I mean, people, investment isn't one of those things that you say, oh, this is something I'm going to lose here. Investment tends to be something I'm going to gain from, and you know, that was, that's what these guys are trying to sell. Yeah. And I think that's absolutely correct. And I do share your view about investor state. If it's not crafted really carefully, and I'm not sure it can, ever can be, it's, go, it's, it's going to be a source of great divisiveness. And I think it's not worth the candle in terms of what it'll do to, um, to relationships in, in economies that have foreign investors. Mm -hmm. But that's, I, I, it's not that I have a sort of principled objection, why the hell should a, a firm be able to sue the government? It's not that. It's that the mechanics of it and the context of it could be very, very destructive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yes, more questions, please. Hello, my name is Jose Miguel Pulido. I work for Mitsui & Co. Thank you very much for great presentations. I wanted to ask about uh, the practical, not just the unthinkable. Uh, if TPP or TTIP actually happen, then there is implementation stage. Uh, and so we might not see the benefits of these, particularly for emerging markets until much, much later. What are the risks associated with that long-term implementation stage? Thank you very much. Thank you. Ted. Hello, uh, I am Ted Moran from the Peterson Institute and from Georgetown, and watch out because I would like to say something upbeat and optimistic. Uh, <laughs> taking off on what Patrick just said and on Caroline about pressures for unilateral liberalization. Okay, so we know that 80% of all trade actually takes place within multinational corporate networks, either inter-affiliate or within su supply chains that have been set up by them. Uh, and this takes two forms. One form is uh, multinationals building plants, but remember the second form is then backward linkages into indigenous and local uh, suppliers. And how do we get each of those forms? Well, you have to do very strong investment promotion that includes advertising how your doing business indicators are getting better. We all know that's a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition. And then you have to back that up with 
infrastructure improvements, some regulatory improvements, in particular in, in intellectual property, and then public-private partnerships in, um, uh, in vocational training. I mean, you can't wait for Vietnam or Sri Lanka or Colombia or Morocco to change its entire educational system, but you can create hubs that have pretty strong vocational training uh, with them working together. So I just picked those four countries because these are countries that want to use foreign direct investment to upgrade and diversify their supply base. Well, then, you know, I talk to people from these countries, I, I talk to uh, companies who want to go to these countries, and I'm, I'm sorry, Jeff, the trade negotiations never come up. There's a lot of emphasis on what's going on on the ground to actually change uh, the ability to set up supply chains and then to build backward linkages to local um, producers. So I think there's a lot going on that doesn't directly depend on the lawyers and the legal provisions. Yes, you want some dispute settlement and maybe you look to bits rather than to, to MAI type solutions, but I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm seeing this much more optimistically. Thank you. Um, interesting, uh, Patrick, uh, your views. I agree with what's just been said, and I think it fits very much into the idea that you don't have to uh, regulate everything, you don't have to make laws about everything, so you have to actually, I mean, it sounds, it may, be, it may sound a bit wishful, but you have to create an environment in which the, 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 mot the, the motivation for cooperation is, is somehow strengthened, and, and, I, and I don't know exactly how you do that. I think this is something more for the political scientists and sociologists and anthropologists than economists who like to model things that aren't real. Um, but I, I absolutely think I agree with you um, about that. And also that I, I, you know, I've been working with this new job I have, where I've been in Hong Kong for a year now after I left WTO. Most of my time has been interviewing uh, companies about services. And it's interesting how many of these companies, when you ask them, when you get into discussions with them about what they're trying to do and where they're sourcing from, and all these questions about outsourcing, some of those com companies have explicit policies to ask the question, company-wide, can we outsource this locally? If we can, do it. If we can't, is there any, what are the other options? And I see more and more of these companies that are doing precisely what you said. And you don't, it's, it's not about, well, I'm, I have a bit of a problem with CSR. This isn't about CSR. This is about the bottom line, straightforwardly about the bottom line. So, so I really do think that that's something, I don't know how we nurture it, but I think it's real and I think it's, it's growing. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. the one other question. Yeah, on, great, great. Sorry, on T TPP and, and TTIP and the, the long time it'll take to see their implementation. I think it's got, I don't, yeah, I mean, I, but we've got to get it through Congress first um, and various other things. I would worry about um, delayed benefits until we see that they're there because the market will move quite quickly to realize the fact of those benefits. And not everything will wait until the agreement's in place. People will, will be willing to invest if, if they know it's gonna happen. Thank you. Maybe, maybe, let me just make a, a, a small commercial here that I think that uh, for some of the countries in, uh, in TPP, and we are discussing with uh, Jeff before, um, it, TPP will be a very important driver of uh, reform, uh, structural reform in many of these places. And I think that uh, uh, this is one area where, uh, where the World Bank Group uh, should be ready uh, to provide support uh, for implementation of this agreement. And I think this will be very, very relevant. Uh, Jeff. Um, well, I would endorse uh, uh, what you've both said. Uh, clearly, uh, there are good business practices uh, that can that can uh, deepen investment in uh, overseas, uh, and they're good business practices because they are sustainable. And the only way you can sustain it in business is if you can show that it's going to be profitable over time. 
it, it could mean you have a, a slightly longer time horizon than going quarter to quarter uh, earnings reports. Uh, but the companies, and I, and I know GE has done this uh, in, in many of its countries, uh, it's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a forced localization uh, practice, but a localization practice that uh, ensures the sustainability of the operation over, over time. Um, the, the risk of a, what I call an implementation lag on trade agreements is real. Uh, uh, we looked at this recently with regard to how long it took uh, between the signing of a trade agreement a U.S. free trade agreement and entry into force. Uh, and it, it may surprise you that some controversial agreements like NAFTA were implemented rel relatively quickly. It took about 13 months from the signature to entry into force of NAFTA. Uh, but uh, that uh, uh, pace of implementation has slowed considerably. Uh, uh, for a variety of reasons, but uh, in the case of Korea uh, and uh, uh, Colombia uh, and, and, and a few others, it's, it's been four or five years. Um, and that was a concern when one's looking at TPP because you have 12 countries. Now, we don't know what the final provisions are in terms of the criteria for entry into force? Will it be only after all 12 countries ratify, or is there a certain percentage of GDP that accommodates the U.S.? Uh, uh, it's it, it, it's un, un, unclear. Uh, also unclear is whether during this implementation gap, whether the uh, there will be access of uh, new members or negotiation of, of new entrants to the uh, TPP club. And that's something that I've proposed uh, be considered because of the risk that there could be a protracted uh, uh, period before entry into force. Uh, but uh, if the negotiators are doing their job right, they would set conditions so that uh, 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 this could hopefully uh, be, uh, be, uh, be, uh, be resolved sooner rather than later. Uh, and as Mike Froman says, the best way to guarantee uh, uh, ratification of the agreement is to produce a good agreement. All right, thank you. Uh, any last uh, question uh, from uh, from the audience? All right, if not, let me turn to the speakers uh, for a final comment that you may want to share with us uh, before closing. Um, uh, Jeff, would like to say a word? Well, thank you. I, 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 I am glad to, to have Patrick finally here at, at our institute, and uh, I think uh, from, from the insights that he's shown and uh, uh, his irreverence uh, and, and factual knowledge, I think we should invite him back more often. Uh, uh, so uh, he's been a long, old friend and, uh, and uh, continues to be a very good friend. Well, that's, thank you, Jeff. That's very kind of you. Unfortunately, my boss in, in Hong Kong doesn't like me traveling, and I always have to make it sound really convincing. So, um, <laughs> um, I'm, we agreed on most things. I think you've got it wrong on TPP, but that's just a detail. No, I'm only kidding. Um, and I, is, I, and I, but I do think we, I think what's really interesting about all this is we are entering uncharted waters. We really are. And the, the, the challenges are probably greater than, I don't know since when, but I think we, there's an awful lot up for grabs in terms of what's going to happen uh, in, in the next months and years. And it's, it's funny to watch um, what's going to happen next week in Beijing. Everyone's scrambling with all these different, you know, the Australians and the Chinese, Taiwan wants to do something with China. Um, you've got all these shows going on in the, in the margins of, of APEC and the, and the Chinese hoping that the people who do TPP will not have got an agreement which they can trumpet in Beijing. So I, I, I don't know, I, I, just, I just hope that we can get enough good sense and, a, and enough leadership whatever it takes. I don't know how this leadership is generated. Uh, when, when I hear people say political will, I always say that doesn't mean anything and sort of say leadership doesn't mean very much either. You've got to say, well, what are the ingredients? Why is it lacking? What can happen to, 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 to bring it about? I, I personally, and I, I mean, I know some people don't like this, but I personally think that when, when China and the United States see more 
want more to work for in common, we're going to find ourselves in a much better place. That's my parting thought. And Jeff, once again, thank you. And you're coming to Hong Kong, right? We're going to have a good... I hope so. Excellent. Well, um, thank you. Uh, thank you all very much uh, for coming. Uh, thanks to, uh, to our panelists and to the Peterson Institute for, uh, for hosting. So uh, let us conclude with a round of applause for our panelists. Uh, thank you. Thank you.